Well, we're going to talk further about community, and we're going to take it from a different angle today. We've uh, spoken about uh, elements within a community and what makes a, uh, a valuable Christian community experience, uh, but I'm going to take a different way. Um, why should we have community? Hmm. Why should we have community? Hmm. That's a, a worthwhile topic. Uh, remember last week, uh, last few weeks, we've talked about the uh, aspects that make a good community. A church community is one that loves one another, serves one another, takes care of one another, and forgives one another. And those are good aspects of a Christian life, and they are uh, active in the life of the Central Schwankfelder Church, and we can always uh, do better and should uh, do better uh, as we uh, seek to live out uh, the, Christian, um, uh, the Christian life. But let's take it from a different uh, perspective today. What about the need for community? Why is it necessary when the Christian life is all about uh, just Jesus and me? Isn't it? Or is it? Hmm. Um, and if I need Christian community, then what might be the aspects that should be uh, required uh, within it? So we're really um, uh, circling back on what is the need, and I'm going to take it uh, from uh, this vantage point today. Uh, because it's our identity, because we are followers of Jesus Christ, we need community. It's not just uh, an option, uh, but it's actually something that is uh, necessary. If you saw uh, today's uh, message from uh, Pastor Julian, you'll know that he spoke on Ephesians chapter 2, but to thinking of these verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Yes, we're not just strangers, not those uh, who are um, uh, doing things individually, but the scripture text itself already tells us that we're part of a community and part of a, uh, being the membership of the household of God. But I'm going to press it a little bit further today to say, what are particular needs that show up in a believer's life as they follow Jesus that therefore demand community? In other words, as we try to follow Jesus in our individual walks with the Lord, what are the certain things that surface that only a Christian community can meet? Not another social organization, whether it's a, a philanthropic one, a, one with the, the guys or the gals that we like, but specifically, what can a Christian community bring that no other community can? Well, it's going to involve uh, circling back on some uh, texts from the Gospels where the very first Christian community was uh, started as Jesus brought disciples to himself. And I want to read uh, about four or five passages, have you comment, and then we're going to try and direct that to why that means that we individually as followers of Jesus today still need a particular community that will bless us as we follow him. So that's where we're going. So let's see. Good. Let's uh, look at a few challenging texts. My guess is you're well familiar with these. Let's start with Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. The very first people that were brought to Jesus. And if you remember this uh, scene from Mark 1, uh, verses 16 through 20, it's about Simon Peter and Andrew, and they're at the Sea of Galilee, and what happens? We read in verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired servants, uh, with the hired servants, and followed him. So the first four disciples that are being called, they're at their jobs. They're probably reasonable jobs, uh, being a fisherman, the Sea of Galilee, as some have said, uh, could be somewhat lucrative. Some have said, well, maybe it's not as lucrative, but uh, they're doing okay in their jobs. They seem to be satisfied, and they're there mending the nets. 
And then all of, a, all of a sudden, along comes Jesus, and he decides to call these four uh, disciples, uh, who would be disciples. And what do they do? They immediately drop the nets and follow him. That's quite a change, isn't it? From all of a sudden one day, uh, or one second, mending the nets, and then all of a sudden, something is very, very different. It not only happened like this for uh, these four disciples, but uh, other sections of the gospel, such as uh, the uh, section of Mark 2, 13 and 14, where Jesus calls Matthew, the tax collector, also known as Levi. It's something similar. He's at his occupation uh, as a tax collector, and all of a sudden Jesus comes and says, follow me. And Levi, Matthew, uh, gets up, and then he goes to follow Jesus. Let's keep that in the back of our mind. Let's look at another passage that talks now about following as this very first Christian community is being pulled together. And as you think on this and the uh, other couple passages, uh, just think in terms of, of following and the way that that influences a community. And I'll have us all talk about it uh, uh, in a moment. Let's go now to Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. Reading there, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Well, that's a challenging passage, isn't it? Where Jesus now is uh, requested to have, uh, or some have uh, wanted to see if they would uh, should come and follow him, and Jesus dissuades them, implying that following Jesus means doing some of these uh, 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 suppositions that uh, that Jesus says. Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Okay, but Jesus sort of is countering him. Will you really? Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Okay, well, that's quite a challenge, uh, meaning that if one's going to follow Jesus, um, uh, maybe one's not going to know exactly where one's going to sleep all the time. Well, then this is uh, uh, also uh, culturally challenging, where um, one of them says, let me go first bury uh, my father. That would be natural in first century culture to be responsible for one's father and be responsible for one's family. But Jesus says, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead, implying that the follower of Jesus may have to stand against his family. Okay. Keep that in your mind as we go to another section about following. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Okay, that's a big challenge, right? If we're going to follow Jesus in this initial uh, Christian community, what does it mean? Taking up one's cross and following him daily. Uh, that's not an easy thing. Um, first century people would have known what a cross meant. Uh, it would be difficult. It would be suffering. It would be hard. Uh, it would be lonely. But that's all part of the very first community that uh, Jesus calls. Now, just bear with me one last passage. It's a little longer, but you'll be familiar with it. It's when a rich young man comes up to Jesus and asks to follow him. Matthew 19, 16 through 19. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. 
honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful. Okay, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Well, just reading along a little bit further from that uh, text, Jesus says to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my, my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay, well, there we go. I've uh, given you the opportunity to look at several texts about following as Jesus brings together the first community. Uh, I'm curious your reaction to some of them. Uh, and also, I will then, after this discussion, move us on to some implications for uh, Christian community life. But uh, some thoughts, comments on these few texts, all linked with following Jesus. Drake, I think that one point that's pretty sobering is the idea that if you follow Christ, it could mean a divide in your family. I, I remember uh, Scott Tibbetts uh, talking about um, the people that he would minister to in Thailand, um, talking about those that left the Buddhist faith for Christianity, that their family would forsake them because they were depending on those, um, th th those um, their family members to contribute alms so that they could graduate to a better level of the afterlife. And so if your family member left the Buddhist faith or Christianity, then that dashes those hopes. Yeah, and, and the stories that you shared, David, are, of course, found in many other places uh, where uh, one has to uh, stand against a, a, a religion from which your, your family grew up in. It, it is very sobering. I think the aspect where uh, the uh, rich, uh, rich young man, and when you think about it, uh, you know, that's the last you ever hear of him in the, uh, in the New Testament. And it's not just giving, getting away from uh, the uh, money, but it's any type of uh, possessions that you have to be giving away. Yeah, I mean, it, this definitely challenges uh, thoughts on possessions, doesn't it? They're very, very challenging, very, very uh, uh, difficult ones. But they have implications for community. So, uh, but let's, if you have some comments about the text uh, first, then before we apply it to the community, that now's, now's a good time. Well, Drake, I think that it seems like he's saying you're not going to just follow like a blind sheep. You're going to have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to maybe part with your family, like, like uh, David said, but... It's not like we're gonna have a parade and it's gonna be all roses. It's gonna be hard. And, and yet, he, and I forget which text he made the promise that we're not in it alone. That we have the power of the Holy Spirit to help us follow. Yes, yeah, very, very, very true, yes. Yeah, and that there will be an aid in this. Right. But there's, there's something that I'm going to eventually drive to that I think you've just touched on, Nancy, is that uh, this is a unique gathering, the Christian community. Uh, it is not like another social group that is out there when there are these type of factors playing in. 
and I'll develop that in a second, but uh, you've, you've already started to, uh, to anticipate that, so thank you. Well, and I, I would add, Drake, that um, uh, there's the promise, and, and the, the scripture reference escapes me right now, but there's the promise that e even those who do forsake family and, and, and different elements of their life will be, will, will be rewarded, um, you know, many times over, both in this life and in the life to come. Yes, and that's actually part of uh, one of the texts that we read here was the uh, Matthew 19, 27 through 30. Yeah, there it is. It's the one that's still up on the screen. I guess one of the things that strikes me about all this is that when you're, when you're following Jesus and you read, you read all these texts and you, you realize just how tremendously challenging all these things are, the community is a little bit like a support group. Uh, yes. If you have a number of people going through the same thing, you get a tremendous amount of support. But if you're if you're all alone and you're not in a community, I got to believe it would be extremely much more difficult to follow. Pre precisely, <laughs> with with these type of factors, the Christian community becomes a, a a place where we can bear each other up, so we can keep on following. Just as, as Nancy was alluding to earlier that this doesn't become just any other, other social group, um, uh, but has unique factors to, uh, to contribute to help us follow, follow the Savior. Thank you, Carl. Greg, um, yeah. also true, I think, that we're not all called to do the same thing. Missionaries depend on people back home that are supporting them, and some of us are called to be pastors like you and David and just stay in one place and take care of a community. Others are called to, you know, to teach and, and we're called to do different things as part of the body. So there are some people that are called to be homeless and move around the world, but we're not all called to do the same thing. Right, uh, that's that's a very good point too, uh, and I, and, I, and I appreciate that. But but the factors that are putting together for a, a, a Christian followers in general produce a community that is different than let's, than let's say um, I don't know. Let's let's be sports fans for a moment. And let's just assume, and I'm I'm sorry I'm to be assuming here uh, that we're all Phillies fans. All right. <clears throat> Sorry if some of you are not Phillies fans. Uh, sorry, and we David. might gather together at uh, Citizens Bank Park and support the Phillies, and we might watch them on TV. And I mean, I happen to like the Phillies uh, too. But the factors that make one a Phillies fan are very different than the factors that make one a follower of Jesus. So I'm trying to distinguish between, let's say, two types of social groups, or many types of social groups, in that the church has some unique aspects because we are all following Christ to one extent, and that produces unique factor. Yeah, okay. Just summarizing these, uh, the passages that we have read. God's calling for his people can be abrupt. They may not be abrupt uh, uh, for you as they have been abrupt uh, for, for some, but my point is that they can be abrupt. Uh, they might be abrupt, where somebody is you know, heading one direction, gives their heart to Jesus, and it's a dramatic change. Uh, that that would fit, let's say, the disciples by the Sea of Galilee, wouldn't it? The call to Jesus may change our lifestyles dramatically. For some of us, it hasn't changed it dramatically. For others, it has. Hardship may be involved. Sacrifice, riches, or family may be involved. And sacrificial living is likely involved to some extent. Those things all have the potential to produce a unique type of community experience which is what Carl was saying previously. There we go. So here's some consequent needs that then emerge from following Christ. If Jesus can call uh, us to himself suddenly, then those who have this experience provide a significant relationship that cannot be replicated outside the church. Uh, just to use your example, uh, David, of uh, uh, the Buddhist uh, who is uh, in Thailand who gives his heart to Jesus, there's no way going back uh, uh, towards, uh, towards Buddhism if one is giving one's heart to Jesus. He can't find or she can't find the type of supportive relationship that, that is necessary outside the church. Then those who have given up more lucrative careers, you're alluding to uh, Matthew, to follow uh, the Savior, 
understand this in ways that uh, others outside the church can't. If we're going to give up riches to follow Jesus, as, as Levi did, then where is one going to find the support for that? In a spot where people have similarly given up things to follow the Savior. If Jesus may lead us to move away emotionally or physically, then those from the Christian fellowship understand this uniquely. And those in the church can understand this in ways that outsiders simply can't. If Jesus calls us to pick up our cross and follow daily, only other Christians can under, understand this aspect in the world. Uh, a non-Christian can't. Uh, if we're suffering to follow Jesus, where will we look for our support and strength to follow him except in the church, in the church community? And if Jesus calls us to be more generous to Christian causes, then those in the body of Christ understand uniquely what sacrificial giving is all about. Now, I'm going to give an example, and then I'm going to let you co uh, comment on this. Um, and I think uh, I was thinking about this, particularly in light of our church. Um, and this is a church that uh, I served as an interim pastor in for 18 months. It was an inner... Um, um, it was an interim pastorate uh, in um, The Hague in the Netherlands. Very interesting place, about 120 people uh, on a Sunday morning from 30 or so different nationalities. And we're all thankfully speaking in English uh, to each other. And there was one Sunday, I can't remember why it was asked, but uh, one of the elders in the church who was leading the service uh, uh, asked for a show of hands from those who had been in the church for over five years. <laughs> and I, th I thought, this is amazing that somebody's asking this question, having grown up at Central, and I mean, we, we could trace uh, uh, people back generation after generation. I, I'm just thinking, oh, that it, uh, at Central, we probably have about 80 to 90% maybe who would say that they've been involved with the church for over, over that amount of time. Well, on that day, it was only 20%. I thought, this is amazing. Only 20% of these folks here have been involved with this church for over five years because the international community is feeding into this place. And we are seeing people from different, completely different backgrounds. And what they are searching for is a community where they can sympathize with one another, pray for each other, care for each other. And of course, as good Christians do, eat with one another. And they ate, uh, we had some very nice international meals, but this dynamic in the community was focused upon supporting one another who have, let's say, moved because of the calling of the Lord to I don't know, be as a, serve as a, as a diplomat uh, in The Hague, uh, or be uh, uh, working in the government, in the international um, uh, community, uh, or uh, just present because of immigration reasons. And this community had come together not over uh, the fact that we have always, let's say, uh, been together or have uh, been located in an area, but that this uh, uh, dynamic of following Jesus became a means to hold people together in a church where people are so um, different as far as race, as far as uh, mother tongue, uh, as far as uh, economic uh, background and nationality. Maybe you have some thoughts and some, some comments uh, on this um, at this point. Well, I'll, I'll give a thought. I, I don't think you can even discuss Christian community and how it's different without mentioning the Trinity, which is the basis of all Christian community and, and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, agreed. Agreed. And, and that becomes also a uniqueness. But I could have taken it that way, Chris. I haven't, I haven't done so today, but, but it, it certainly. You also, when you think about the... Uh, Christian community, you can think about it, this is in the uh, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. early Roman period, where the, one of the emperors was promoting the fact that the Christians were supporting one another in taking care of the needs and all, while the Roman government and uh, the, the pagan belief, believers weren't. And he was chastising them because, you know, there's these Christians that are Again, as a community, not only taking care of one another, but they're reaching out and helping the non-believers. Yeah, so it, it sets itself off against uh, the Greco-Roman secular world at that time. Is that where you're going, Bill? Yes. Well, I, I have a comment. I guess uh, thinking back over my life, I mean, I came, grew up in a 
place where there were many, many Christians and maybe the need to, uh, for community didn't seem quite the same as it does now, but when they were, were being attacked from all kinds of uh, outside sources, the secular world, I certainly think it helps us uh, to be able to be together and to meet together, and particularly your experience there over in the Netherlands, uh, this church and other churches over there, high, low, and whatever. I mean, it's a, it's a place where you can get together and, uh, and support each other. I mean, a situation there where you're so much under, maybe not outward attack, but implied attack by the outside world. Uh, I mean, we're experiencing that more than we ever did, but uh, overseas where you were, it's definitely a big thing. But I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Dad, because uh, th this secular, this uh, world in the West right now has changed, and that also brings new factors uh, to us, which makes, I would say, Christian community ever more vital as we as we move forward. I'm going to turn to that uh, in a second. The secular world, I'm specifically emphasizing secular because I believe we're living in a time where uh, God is being uh, uh, factored out of uh, societal life in, um, in greater, ever greater ways, and I'm not alone with that. But the secular world uh, increasingly cannot help. Um, it cannot help uh, provide the um, uh, encouragement that we need from following after Jesus, who is so unique uh, and so uh, very different uh, from uh, uh, what the world has uh, around us. And I'm going to appeal to a study that I read about uh, Heroes that was uh, just released in 2017, which is telling us uh, this uh, a survey um, uh, was telling us that there's an ever increasing lack of role models and heroes in the public sphere. So let me share with you about uh, this book. Maybe some of you have uh, uh, heard, this, heard of this book. It's uh, worth picking up. It's called, Where Have All the Heroes Gone? The Changing Nature of American Valor. Where Have All the Heroes Gone? The Changing Nature of American Valor. It's published by Oxford uh, Press. Um, and it's really a study, though, that was done here in the States by, uh, at uh, Farley Dickinson by uh, uh, scholars uh, Peabody and, uh, and Jenkins. They analyzed a number of people through surveys and uh, uh, focus groups and um, from the past 50 years in American life, they have said that public distrust is on the rise. And I found that this stat was uh, particularly uh, uh, concerning. In a survey that was taken, 59% of Americans said that they were unable to identify any public heroes. Wow, 59%, that's well over half of, uh, uh, the uh, group that was surveyed, uh, unable to identify public heroes. And when it came to heroic qualities, they uh, analyzed uh, the culture, uh, our, our culture, and found that uh, those in this survey felt that sacrificing career ambitions in exchange for helping others, that's truly heroic and working hard to provide for one's family also is truly heroic, 76% finding that uh, to be of uh, value, versus rising to the top of one's profession, only 28% uh, of finding that uh, to be um, of uh, heroic quality. But it seems in a secular world that more and more are paying greater attention to rising to the top of one's profession rather than choosing to sacrifice in exchange for helping others or working hard to provide for one's family. But I, uh, I'm sure, uh, this is a leading question, I'm sure of these three values that are placed here, which of the two will you think to find will be uh, encouraged in the life of the church and encouraged from following Jesus as opposed to, let's say, uh, looking out uh, for one's self. I'm curious what you might have to say about uh, this study and uh, uh, the secular uh, values that are presented as opposed to the values and following Jesus that we've looked at previously. Some thoughts. Well, Drake, I, immediately as you start to talk about this, I, I think we're experiencing a real life situation of heroes all around us. People that are, that are dealing with this virus, people who are on the front lines. I mean, and people are, I think, are, are recognizing 
heroes in this in this group. I mean, this is this is a real life experience that's happening right now in the last two two months of, of people who are sacrificing themselves, not just Christians, but sacrificing themselves and are acting as as real heroes, in my opinion. Yeah, and they are, and these being uh, first responders, yes. <laughs> I wasn't thinking so much of necessarily a first responder as that I am of the, the healthcare workers. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm grouping them in into okay in, in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, to some extent, you think of the idea of the hero and relating to uh, the old thing. Everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame, and um, again, it's all about uh, positioning and taking care of your brand and all that and not really dealing with the fundamentals because you're seeking, a lot of times you see it, seeking to be the hero. And that's really, if you wanna look at it, more of a, uh, a product of your behavior, not, not your goal. Mm -hmm. uh, Drake, it's yeah. Chris. Mm, please. Um, I just had another thought when your dad was mentioning the people that are taking care of so many of the sick and kind of contrasting that with the American way of being the most educated to the top of your career, to have the best career, to be the smartest. And yet right now, I think it's kind of a reset because all of a sudden we're really realizing that the truckers that drive across the country and make sure we have food have been mm -hmm. heroes and the people that are checking out at the grocery stores um, and the people that are cleaning, uh, you know, right now, I think maybe it's a good thing for us to see that um, there's a lot of value in everybody, not necessarily this secular um, desire to always be the best, making the most money, have the most advanced career. Yes. Yes, agreed, agreed, and and we are going through a societal reset now. Um, and so I'd be curious as to how this uh, uh, study would have been done um, uh, about heroes if we were taking it in the time of the pandemic as opposed to uh, in 2017. Absolutely. <laughs> but these uh, values of sacrificing for others, uh, helping out, uh, whether one is, as you said, Chris, a, a truck driver, or as uh, my father said, a, a health worker, or uh, in other ways, uh, let's say, uh, uh, keeping society going uh, during the time of a pandemic. I mean, those type of values, that, those, those are uh, uh, presented and come forward uh, from the Christian faith, and they, they, they are valuable. Um, and in the secular world, which uh, previously has been uh, undermining uh, these things, uh, it's the Christian uh, uh, church that uh, provides things that uh, are, are so, so important, uh, not only for society, but uh, uh, important for us as we continue on to follow Jesus, who calls us to pick up our cross and follow him daily. I think I'm just going to leave you with this. I, I'm, I had more of a presentation, but we're going to, we're, perhaps we'll pick that up in the future. Um, but the Christian community presents something unique, and as Ali appealed to uh, rightly, it is Jesus who is the, the ultimate hero. He is the ultimate uh, person in the center of, of this community. And as uh, we as his followers follow in his train, we are around others with, who are promoting heroic values that will help us through times of suffering, times of challenge, uh, times where we might have to be uh, emotionally uh, separated from uh, friends or family due to uh, a Christian commitment. This is a very unique entity that we have as the church. Um, so as we think about community, we, we think about uh, um, uh, coming back uh, together in the future, uh, uh, we're not just a social group uh, that's out there like oh, the Lions Club or the Phillies or uh, other uh, community groups. We have unique dynamics focused on the ultimate hero, Jesus Christ, and those who are trying to follow after him. And I, I do hope that uh, when we all resume, that uh, uh, not only will we uh, uh, be supportive uh, of each other in an ever greater extent, uh, but we will even choose to be uh, uh, further understanding and uh, building up of one another. We are a very unique thing that is in this world uh, as the church, and we do need each other. Uh, physically and emotionally and spiritually as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ.